made it ugly. So a little over a year ago, one sunny day I logged onto the internet to find out that my fellow film YouTubers had come together to create this awesome joint video project called One Marvelous Sea, which I wasn't cool enough to be invited to. And as some of you very precisely pointed out, I was immediately triggered like an insecure man-child and stormed off to begin a film YouTube civil war with my own opposite project, One DC Sastra Scene. And now, 15 months later, here we go again. This time, my fellow film creators are looking at positive moments in the X-Men universe in form of one excellent scene, to which once again, I wasn't cool enough to be invited. And once again, I am triggered like an insecure man-child. So instead of showing any personal growth and just joining this positive movement like everyone else, I will be storming off to create my own opposite project where we look at negative moments in the Fox Marvel universe. One excruciating scene. And when talking about negatives in the Fox Marvel universe, what better way to begin doing so than with perhaps the most disastrous excruciating movie to ever come out of it, Fantastic. To be fair to Fantastic Four, there are positive things to say about this movie. One, it was the best theater experience I've ever had because I was the only person in the theater. Two, the first half of it is not at all bad. Like for the first 15 minutes where we get to watch what clearly was director Josh Trank's vision, it's not only competent but actually pretty good. But then, once we get to the midpoint, the movie essentially self-destructs. After our heroes have returned from the alternate dimension and been taken in by the US government, there's suddenly a one-year time jump that essentially takes Josh Trank's movie and forcefully mangles it into something entirely else. If you didn't know, this is where we begin the Fox corporate movie that they reshot into existence without Trank. And you can easily spot this reshot material because they had to CGI out Kate Mara's mustache. In a nutshell, once that first 50 minutes is up, we go from Fantastic Four to Fantastic, which ended up destroying the entire thing. And that destructive second half of this thing is what we're going to be focusing on today. Not exactly a single scene, but it's my project, so I can do whatever I want. And so, to kick off one excruciating scene, let's take a look at Fantastic in order to find out what exactly it did in order to successfully obliterate Fantastic Four. Also, since I am starting a war here, I'm gonna need an army. If you want to make your own one unfantastic scene video about any movie in the Fox Marvel Universe, feel free to do so. And if you're someone who would like to do so but simply don't know how, I got you. Because for today, I've once again partnered with Skillshare, where you can find educational courses and classes on anything you need. If you don't know how to edit a video, here's how you find out. If you don't know how to write a video, here's how you find out. For example, you can check out this this class that deep dives into how to write essays about pop culture and what you need to know to find success in it. So if you want to join me in this project or just start making these types of videos all together, here's how to begin. A premium Skillshare membership costs you 8 bucks a month, but no worries friend, because if you click my link below before a thousand other people do, you'll get to use it for two months for free. You can go check out whatever classes you need to make your video and then see if you enjoy it enough to want to keep doing it. Be part of the one excruciating scene army. Be part of the Filmento army. But first, Fantastic. Like I mentioned, 50 minutes into Fantastic Four, our heroes have gained their powers and been taken in by the US government. And then all of a sudden, there's this one-year time jump which essentially begins a whole new movie. And the first problem with this time jump is that it completely robs us of all the tension and momentum and overall emotion that the first half was building to make possible. Because it essentially skips over the change that's meant to convey that emotion. For example, the first half ends in this massive choice where Ben Green has turned into a pile of rocks and then his best friend Reed Richards chooses to leave him behind in order to escape the US facility. But now that the movie just jumps a year forward, we never get to see what this choice does to Ben, only what it has done to him. In terms of potential, you already know what he's accomplished in the field. He's been active in covert operations with a 100% success rate. We appreciate all you're doing for us. Well, that was the deal. 
Suddenly, Ben has become an operative for the US Army in exchange for a potential cure. And the issue is that we never saw how he got here. We never get to see Ben agonizing over Reed leaving him behind. We never get to see how that agony and anger molds him as a person and pushes him to start working for the army. We never get to see the change that he goes through. We just see him having gone through it. Does it hurt? I'm used to it. This isn't a consequential obstacle filled next step to what happened. It's just a new status quo norm, another day in the new life of Ben the Rock. And normal usual days do not build up the emotion and tension and momentum you've brought to life before. They just deflate all of it back to square one where you have to start building it up again. And it's not just Ben, it's the others too. You know how the whole point of this movie is to have these normal people gain these amazing unnormal powers. How the emotion of it all comes from seeing how they are changed by these powers, how they discover and cope with them, how they and their relationships are affected by them, how they overcome the obstacles caused by them. Well, that's not fantastic. All exhibited unique physical conditions. We develop suits which allow them to contain and control these conditions. This subject's suit controls her spectral flares and refractive visibility. Right, a few runtime minutes after our heroes have gained their powers, they're already comfortable with them. They know how to use them, and whatever choices and obstacles they face because of them, they've already made and overcome. It isn't anything new that changes them, it's just another normal status quo day where they have already changed. And and that carries zero emotion. If you want to skip the origin story and have the characters already master their powers, that's fine. But then why did you spend the previous 50 minutes building up an origin story? Same with the characters and their arcs themselves. Johnny Storm's arc is to leave his pointless life behind and find a purpose for himself. But here he's already found that purpose, so we never get to feel the emotion of him finding it. Reed and Ben's close relationship is meant to fall apart and mold them as people. But here that relationship has already fallen apart a year ago and they've already accepted it and been molded by it. I'm not your friend. Sue Storm learns to question authority and criticize the government's agenda, but we never see what exactly happened that turned her this way, so it just kind of makes no sense. All in all, movies are about change to the norm, and if you suddenly establish a new norm where that change has already happened, you're basically starting a new movie, which at the 50 minute mark is not very wise. Characters being something is never as interesting or emotionally powerful as characters becoming something. Wait, thanks. His effectiveness this past year has been unprecedented. He exhibited unique physical conditions, developed suits which to contain and control these conditions. 100% success rate, protecting our men and women in battle and saving countless lives. Now that the movie has restarted itself with a new norm, it then starts bringing in new change to break this norm in terms of characters and plot, as you are supposed to do. But the problem is that unlike with most movies where this happens at the start, we are now past the midpoint where things are meant to feel much much bigger and stronger than at the start. And since we just began and have had no time to build anything, everything that happens just ends up feeling weak and overall like nothing. As an example, now Ben finally finds out Reed's location and is sent out to capture him. In other words, after having their relationship fall apart a year ago, now these former besties finally face off, which by definition should pack an insanely massive impact. Until you remember that here we never actually built this up in any way. We never saw Ben change into someone who hates Reed. We never saw Reed change into someone who feels bad about leaving Ben behind. We just saw the current norm where they have already changed. And so the resulting face off is this. Why? I'm no good to you, to anyone. This is all my fault. That we can agree on. Did you know? You 
That's right, there's nothing underneath this face-off that would make it feel important. So the whole thing just comes off as forced and empty and overall laughably weak. The clash in Civil War functioned in such a strong manner because it was built up to. Because we'd seen the relationship Cap has with Bucky, as well as the relationship Tony had and has with his dead parents. Here, it just feels like we get a payoff to a setup that doesn't actually exist. If Ben blames Reed for turning him into a rock, it would have been useful to see Ben struggling to live with his new rock form, instead of just saying that after the clash. I'm not your friend. You turn me into something else. Honestly, it would have been useful to see this stuff with every character. We have Sue also being pissed off at Reed for leaving them. He abandoned us, left us here. But we never saw even a reaction from her upon Reed leaving them or what that did to her personally. So it just feels even more forced and empty than with Ben. And so and so on. Reed is obsessively searching for a way to revert what he did to himself and Ben. But we've never seen a single moment where he expresses sadness and regret over what he did. So whatever. Johnny is actively flying around for the government and doesn't want to break free from this norm because that is his new purpose. But we have no sense as to why it became his new purpose or what he's even doing or why. So whatever. Sue thinks the government is using them and doesn't want them to cooperate. But we have absolutely no idea how she came to this conclusion. So I guess it's not that big of a deal. He abandoned us, left us here. Please don't leave me! I'm sorry! Look who it is. Hey. And then there's the plot. Basically, the new main goal for the team is to finish the second portal thing and find a way to get rid of their powers, because doing so is very important. They're not powers, they're aggressively abnormal physical conditions that okay. we're gonna fix. Whatever it is, we can find a way to reverse it. It's the only chance we have to figure out what happened to us and reverse it. We'll reopen the gate, find a cure, end this. The only problem is that the movie has no basis for us to care about any of this. Aside from maybe Ben, who's a pile of rocks now, the characters have zero established incentive to reverse what happened. Johnny seems to like his new abilities just fine. Sue doesn't seem that bothered by them either, nor does Reed. And so why is it so important for them to get rid of their powers? It isn't. Which is why this main plot in the second half feels barely as important as the one at the start of Birds of Prey, where Harley Quinn is trying to eat a sandwich. Movies are about escalation. The further we go, the bigger and stronger the situations should feel. If the stuff that happens in the second half of your movie is on the same level of impact as the stuff that happens in the first half, then your movie will come off as monotone and like it's stuck in place emotionally. Which isn't very good. Eventually, the movie moves into the third act, where, to its credit, it does seem to know that in order to give the audience a satisfying ending, it also has to conclude the elements that were set in motion in the first half. But despite doing so successfully, the issue is that since it spent all this time on all this other stuff, those elements from the first half just weren't developed far enough to warrant the conclusion given to them. Take the ending battle, for example. The whole gist here is that Doctor Doom has fallen in love with this other dimension alien planet and starts starts destroying the Earth preemptively in order to prevent the Earth from destroying his planet. And the basis for him to do so is that, as the movie in the first half introduced, the Earth is dying, and so sometime in the future the people of Earth would have to suck his planet dry in order to survive. This is our chance to learn more about our planet and maybe even save it. New energy, resources, it's a whole new world. Which can help save this one. People running the earth are the same ones running it into the ground, so maybe it deserves what it's got coming to it. The only teeny tiny problem is that since the movie suddenly became about something entirely else, this whole subplot of the earth dying was kinda just for gun. We never went deeper into why the earth is dying or how the alien planet can save it. We never backed any of that up visually in any way. Overall, it just wasn't developed far enough for it to seem real. And so now that we're basing this entire ending climax battle on the tiny occasional first have mentions that the Earth is dying, it mostly just comes off as pretty dumb. The heroes could have just let Doctor Doom go. Doctor Doom could have just destroyed the teleporter and not be bothered by the Earth in the first place. End of story. And also, since we were doing all this other stuff, we never had time to establish an emotional connection to Earth either. At the end, we don't have a single character on Earth that we fear for, so this whole thing ends up becoming just another overly generic blue pillar of light sequence and we 
we just do not care. Secondly, in terms of characters, this ending battle is all about our heroes finally coming together as a team and functioning in perfect sync. And again, it is something that the first half did set in motion. We're gonna have to all come together. Each of you working together with a level of commitment and collaboration, putting aside petty squabbles. He's stronger than any of us. Yeah, he is. But he's not stronger than all of us. But once again, we never developed this working in sync element far enough for it to work. Once our heroes got their powers, they were immediately separated. And so this is the very first time they've ever even tried coming together as a team. As in, they try something for the first time and then succeed right away, which isn't very cinematically involving. In order for this to work, you should have had the heroes try to come together at the midpoint but fail in doing so, so that you establish coming together as an obstacle that they need to overcome. And so now that at the end they finally overcome that obstacle and succeed, it feels like a triumphant victory. It feels like something we can root for and care about. If there's no obstacles in front of characters doing something, we don't care. Thirdly, in addition to just being about saving the earth, this ending battle is also built on very intimately personal stakes. See, in the first half we established this love rivalry triangle with Reed and Doom and Sue. Reed begins to take a liking to Sue and she to him, which doesn't go over well with Doom because he has feelings for Sue as well. And so now that we have these three characters finally clashing together, it's emotionally based on Reed and Sue's care for each other as well as Doom's insecure hatred of the fact that Sue chose Reed over him and that Reed might be smarter than him. As in, it's not just them fighting for the planets, but also to resolve their rivalry relationship. Pretty powerful stuff. Always so smug. Thinking you were smarter than me. Goodbye, Susan. Or it would be powerful if we had actually grown it far enough. Truth is, we never developed real feelings between Reed and Sue, because they got separated. We never developed a real rivalry between Doom and Reed, because everyone including Sue just kind of forgot about Doom altogether when the movie skipped a year into the future and became about something entirely else. <laughs> Being unprofessional. You're supposed to be down here working. We're finished. What? Yeah, we, f we finished it. Do you want to see? Yeah. And therefore, this personal angle as well mostly just feels dumb. There's also the theme of fame versus doing something that matters that's represented by Doom and Reed. Famous faces hired to conquer dreams that weren't even theirs. You're wrong. I don't want to be famous. I just want my work to make a difference. Which never gets even included here in any form whatsoever. But I'm sure by now you get the point. All in all, this ending climax battle just ends up coming off as pretty dumb and we don't care. Just like the movie itself. And that's really it in a nutshell. That's the main point of my one excruciating scene video. If you want to make your own about some other Fox Marvel movie moment or sequence, go ahead. Check out the Skillshare link below, become a pro, pick your side. And I'll see you on the battlefield.